Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. <clears throat> it's 1942, and two Jews have decided they're going to assassinate Hitler. So they start casing out his behaviors, and like a good German, Hitler has the same routine every single day. He goes to work and he drives home to his house and pulls in the driveway every day at eight o'clock. So the Jews smuggle a gun and they decide they're gonna sit in the bushes outside of his driveway and when he pulls in, they're gonna kill him. They get there at 7.30, a half an hour before, they hide in the bushes and they know like clockwork every day, that's what Hitler does. He comes in at eight o'clock. They're there, they have the gun, it's loaded, they're ready. Eight o'clock comes, no Hitler. 8.30, no Hitler. Nine o'clock, no Hitler. 10 o'clock, no Hitler. 11 o'clock, no Hitler. And one Jew turns to the other and says, gee, I hope nothing happened to him. Don't answer this question out loud. But was that joke offensive? Did it make you squirm a little bit? Was it okay for me to share? Was it okay for me to share from the bima? Was it okay for me to share on Shabbat? And if it wasn't okay for me to share, is there any other circumstance that it would have been okay? And what would those circumstances have been? I have not had the privilege to stand on this bima and speak since the Dave Chappelle moment of his opening monologue on SNL most recently. And I know that the political winds have moved in such a forceful way that that episode is now ancient history. But for me, it's still living in my head. Not so much Dave Chappelle and what he said, but the essence and issues with what it was that he said. And I am really caught in the middle of this entire saga. On one hand, I think Dave Chappelle is one of the most brilliant comedians of our generation. He has a little bit of, of Lenny Bruce in him, a lot of Richard Pryor. He's got even, uh, you know, some of the other avant-garde comedians, and he is a thoughtful, brilliant comedian. He does things that comedians are supposed to do. He challenges us, he provokes us, he makes us squirm, and he makes us laugh. But at the same time, at the same time, and I thought the routine was funny. I laughed when I watched it. At the same time, I watched it again, and I could totally understand why some would find his routine over the line. Why some would find that monologue offensive. Why some would say he was trafficking in anti-Semitism or perhaps anti-Semitic tropes. Now, just for a bit of context here, it was only a handful, handful of years ago that Larry David did an opening monologue on Saturday Night Live, and he did a bit in there about the Holocaust. And this was a fusion of Larry David's self-hatingness. First, his self-hating Jewish persona that was fused together with Larry David's just self-hating self-persona. And he made a bunch of jokes about what it would have been like to try and pick up people of the opposite sex in a concentration camp and what his pickup lines would have been. And I heard it from so many different people afterwards how distasteful, how thoughtless, how rude. And then I heard from a whole group of other people how hilarious, how funny, he actually went there. But what I didn't hear from anybody was that Larry David was anti-Semitic or was trafficking in anti-Semitic tropes. Now, while he might have been guilty, Larry David, of bad taste, why was it that no one thought he was anti-Semitic? Is it because Larry David is so overtly Jewish 
and who he is and how he personifies himself. And when I say overtly Jewish, I'm not talking about a guy who davens every day and is strict about kosher. I'm talking about the way he pokes fun at so many things in his Jewish life. And if Larry David did cross the line, I ask you the same question rhetorically now. Did Mel Brooks cross the line when he made The Producers? Did he cross the line with SS soldiers dancing in a way that made an image of a swastika? Did he cross the line when Mel Brooks created a song, Springtime for Hitler in Germany? What is the line? Who creates these lines? And who decides when we cross these lines? And if these lines are so subjective to individual people, to individual tastes, to individual thoughts, and to the particular color of our skin or the religion and affiliation that we subscribe to, then are we at risk of offending everybody at all times? And does that mean that the alternative to offense is silence? Speaking of Saturday Night Live, one of the cornerstones of the show, three cornerstones. One, the opening monologue. Two, the musical guest. And three, weekend update, which always comes after the first appearance of the musical guest. The two current hosts of the weekend update are two gentlemen by the name of Colin Jost and Michael Che. And now it's become twice a year because the segment is so popular, it used to be once a year, the end of the season, that what Michael Che and Colin Jost do is they write jokes that the other person has to tell and the other person never sees them until they're live on the air and has to read them. And what Michael Che continually does, for those of you who don't watch the show, Michael Che is an African-American and Colin Jost is a white Staten Island person who's married to a Jewish woman. What Michael Che does regularly to Colin Jost is he writes jokes that he could get away with as a black man, but Colin Jost could never get away with as a white man to say. But meanwhile, Colin Jost has to read them. And he has to make jokes poking fun at Rosa Parks or Martin Luther King or unemployment that happens amongst the black people, things he would never say and things most importantly, that Jost doesn't believe. You see, I think what makes that segment so funny is knowing that Che wrote those jokes and watching how Jost squirms in his seat when making those jokes. And what I think is critical to that humor working is that Michael Che knows unequivocally that Colin Jost isn't a racist. That's what makes it funny so that you can poke fun at it. But if David Duke, God forbid, were co-hosting Weekend Update, there would be no humor in that joke because he probably subscribes to some of those very views. Or if someone who held those same kinds of views as the likes of David Duke, so would it be. So here's the question. Can someone who's black make jokes about the Holocaust? Can someone who's white make jokes about race? Can someone who's Christian make jokes about Jews? Where is the line for all of us to follow? Now, what's very interesting is I think it was a season ago, maybe two, I apologize, I have no concept of time anymore. Michael Che, in his weekend update, made a joke, a comment about Israel's treatment of Palestinians. On the spectrum of one to 10, it was a six. I laughed at it pretty hard. I didn't find such terrible offense. However, every single Jewish organization that I'm affiliated with brought Che's feet to the fire on this issue. The ADL, the AJC, the, J, the, the UJA, the JFNA, all of these organizations attacked him for saying that his interpretation of how Israel and the Palestinians interact is totally off. Now, 
Bear in mind, Shane made a joke, and I'm specifically not telling the joke because it's irrelevant. And the joke lasted about 12 seconds. It wasn't a 30-minute speech. It wasn't a book that he published. It wasn't an article that was disseminated. It was a 12-second joke that brought up the ire of all of these Jewish organizations. And here's the part that I'm stymied by. Not one of those Jewish organizations wrote a letter or came out with a statement about the jokes Shea wrote for Colin Jost to give about black people. Shouldn't we be equally offended? Shouldn't we be just as upset? What allows him to make those jokes about African Americans and not about Jews or Israel? Who determines the line? And if he determines one line and she determines the other line and I determine the third line, who are you to walk that line and not know where we cross it? It becomes so damn tricky and it ends up becoming that the only way to respond to these things is through silence. And I wonder if that is such a good thing. Now, I bring this up on this Shabbat not only because I haven't had an opportunity yet to talk about Dave Chappelle, but also because it coincides with something we read in the Torah that I think is powerful and magnificent. Joseph has a dream at the very beginning of this Parsha. Nothing criminal in that. All of us have dreams. Joseph shares the dream he had with those in his social orbit, his brothers. Nothing so inherently wrong there. But what was wrong is not the way Joseph told the dream that he had, but the way that his brothers heard the dream. Joseph didn't say, I had a dream about 11 other sheaves that were bowing down, and clearly that was a metaphor for you guys to me. He just said, I had a dream about these 11 cows and these 11 sheaves. This was my dream. And the brothers interpreted it in a way to say, you're against us, you're hurting us. What the brothers did is it fueled a narrative that they needed it to fill, that they wanted it to fill, but never was indicated by Joseph. What if the brothers would have just said, huh, that's an interesting dream, huh? Let me tell you about my dream I had. Huh, you're crazy. That's a silly dream. But because they took it to fulfill a narrative that they wanted and that they needed, that was based on tension, then the entire trajectory of the Jewish people changes forever. It's because of that that Joseph is sold off into slavery, almost killed. It's because of that that he makes his way to Egypt. It's because of that that his brothers find him down there. It's because of that that Jacob goes down there and the progeny of the Israelite people continue there. And that's where Moses comes into play. And the entire story of our Exodus that we read for the next four books happens. It's because if you wanted to get critical and if I wanted to take an interpretive liberty, because of the way the brothers chose to interpret this dream as furthering the negative narrative, then indeed, it created this level of exodus and exclusion that lasted for generations, as opposed to a little bit of tolerance and deference. I worry a lot about things that people say to others and the pain that it causes. And I worry even more about the potency of silence, which we know is so dangerous. It was Martin Luther King that said, it's the silence and apathy of those around us that is the most danger to all of us. He of course was right. And what I think is a very, very scary environment for our world today, one that has me up at night, is that people through podcasts and blogs and social media and the ability to communicate on myriad of platforms are walking around with metaphorical knives that are sharper than ever. Our knives cut deeper 
and are sharper than they've ever been in our history with what we say and how we say it and who we say it to. And at the very same time, and this is the thick irony, our society is walking around where all of us have a thinner skin than we've ever had before. What a dangerous mix. Sharp knives and thin skin makes it a lot easier to cause damage. We're not gonna solve this conundrum today. We're never gonna take a vote amongst the Jewish people and side with the majority or minority as to whether Dave Chappelle was offensive or funny. We're never gonna decide whether it was appropriate for me to tell that joke today or not. We're not gonna understand whether Larry David should be telling jokes about the Holocaust. And if Larry David can't, why Mel Brooks can. And we're not gonna understand why the brothers chose to have that narrative continued. But what I do think all of us can grow from is by taking a moment to blunt our knives and make sure they're not as sharp as they can be or are. That using the shield of social media or blogs or things that don't put us face to face can remind us that we don't have to be as piercing and as direct as we are, might be or have seen allowed to be. And at the same time, all of us can be a little less sensitive too, a little thicker skinned. We can do what our Torah teaches us, Dan Lekavschut, to give someone a benefit of a doubt, to realize that perhaps in sharing a joke or sharing a dream, that it wasn't always malintent that drove them, that perhaps we can see through their vision, just at face value, perhaps at times in places. We won't solve this problem today, but perhaps we all can do things for the future that make it stronger for us to be more understanding, more tolerant, less sensitive, and to know what the lines are, not only for the speaker, but for those who choose to hear what we're saying. Shabbat Shalom, everyone.